Thank you so much, Professor. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, like my wonderful co-moderator just said, people can, of course, continue to trickle in. We'll just continue admitting them. Um, so just a quick note that the attendee chat function is disabled until our Q&A portion. We'll be able to ask our panelists questions. Um, I've also spotlighted myself, the other moderators, and all of our speakers. So hopefully everyone can see that. Amazing. Um, first, I'm so, so glad you can all join us tonight. My name is Emma. I use she, her, her pronouns, and I'm a junior and student representative on the biology department committee uh, for diversity and inclusion. Um, I first want to officially welcome our panelists. Thank you so, so much for taking the time to be here tonight. Um, also a huge thank you to the bio department communications committee, career services, and of course, BT squared for making this event happen. Um, so to get started, it would be great if the panelists could just introduce themselves. Perhaps we could start with um, name, pronouns, your class or graduation year, um, your major, minors, et cetera, at Wellesley, and um, some of your most meaningful experiences at Wellesley. And anyone is welcome to start. We won't go in, you know, alphabetical or in order like that. I can start. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. My name's Tina Trung. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm from Wellesley class of 2013. Um, and what else was part of the introduction? Sure. Of course. Sorry about that. Um, so your major or majors, minors at Wellesley, and then some of your most meaningful experiences at Wellesley. Sorry, it's just been so long. Um, so I was a biological science major. Um, my most meaningful experiences. Um, so I actually transferred in uh, in my junior year. So I um, had a kind of unique Wellesley experience. I would say just it's hard to pinpoint. Um, I feel like I formed a really close group of friends. Um, I still talk to them and being able to access all of Wellesley's awesome professors, I would say is like one of my favorite parts of attending. Um, I, I can go next. Uh, my name's Catherine, I use she, her pronouns, and I graduated in 2010, majored in biology. Um, and yeah, I think from an academic perspective, I, I really loved, um, the professors, especially in the science department, and I had the opportunity to do um, a kind of field work based class, uh, tropical ecology class uh, with Martina Conagher. And um, that was just a really amazing way to kind of apply uh, some of the science we were learning in the real world and have some really fun adventures. So that was definitely a highlight for me. Hello, I'm happy to follow um, Catherine. My name is Nora Wilkins. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I uh, graduated in the class of 2002. So it's been um, a little while as well. Um, and my major was biological sciences. My minor was economics. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm asked often how my time was at Wellesley, how I enjoyed it, enjoyed it and when I thought about it. And I always say without pause that one of uh, the best parts of my experience, experience there was learning as much from my classmates as I did in my classes. And so for that, I feel like I am eternally grateful. Um, and I also um, I'm local to the area. So I did actually go back to Wellesley College as a fifth year student to get the education certification um, as well. So I graduated in 02 and then I received my certification in um, 04. And so that was fun to get back on campus and um, have sort of a different experiment experience outside of the science center. But it's great to be here tonight and I hope I can answer your questions. Um, I could go next. My name is Liz Callahan and I use she, her pronouns and I'm probably the most elderly member of the panel. Um, I graduated back in 1983, um, but I think uh, the Wellesley experience is has been pretty similar through the years. I feel still pretty connected 
My daughter uh, graduated in 2017. And so I've, I've stayed on the campus and involved. I also have a, a good friend who is um, a professor in the physics department now. So I know about what's going on in campus through her. And I think uh, my most um, meaningful experiences were my friendships. And like a lot of people, I'm still very close with a lot of, a lot of my best friends from my Wellesley days. Great, I'll go next. Um, my name is Stephanie Ye. I graduated class of 2018 and I was a bio major and a health and society minor. Um, I'd say like my best experiences at Wellesley that I still think about really fondly are one, you know, the support network from friends that I met through, you know, commiserating through all the uh, like pre-med requisites and then taking all the really exciting classes that, um, a lot really stand out to me and you know the super supportive uh professors that i was able to meet like yui and kim really um helped me through my career and choices so um, i'm really grateful for my time at wellesley wonderful thank you all so much for sharing um so for the second part of introductions it would be great if we could just get a brief summary of your career path um, your current occupation and then maybe your most important or relevant uh, professional and personal goals and then anything else you're inclined to share again in any order Uh, I can I can go again just because I think I graduated the most recent. Um, but yeah, so after graduating from Wellesley, I contemplated a couple of career paths. Um, I obviously, I think as a lot of people in the bio department um, considered going to medical school, but ultimately discovered that that wasn't what I was ultimately looking for. Um, thought about grad school for biology as well, but um, I was thinking, you know, I wanted to try something really different, step out of my comfort zone. So after graduating, I joined CVS Health um, as a digital analyst in their digital leadership program, which was um, one that recruits on campus actively. So definitely shoot me a note if you're at all interested. But um, I was able to join kind of like the tech side of CVS Health um, to support their pharmacy business. And then um, a year later, we had a big merger and acquisition of Aetna. So then I was able to join their new strategy group for um, this new group called Transformation. And we were really tasked with creating new products to support oncology and diabetes. Um, so I was really excited to be part of that group. And then most recently this year, I was um, part of, or I started, or I helped join um, a group uh, that's brand new called Enterprise Virtual Care, and I'm a product manager for their um, telehealth solutions. So it's been kind of a whirlwind three years, but um, very exciting and definitely open to hearing questions on joining tech or kind of this healthcare services space. Um, I can go next. Uh, so like I said, I graduated from Wellesley with a degree in biology and um, was thinking, I think as a lot of people do, that I would I wanted to pursue a graduate degree in, in biology. So um, I spent a couple years as a, a research tech at the Marine Biological Lab in Woods Hole. And then I went to the University of New Hampshire um, and got a master's degree in biology there. Uh, and that experience, um, kind of made me realize I didn't want to do research for the rest of my life, which is a, a pretty big realization for me uh, about what had kind of been a, a long-term goal of mine. Um, and uh, so as I was thinking about, you know, different options, I kept coming back to the fact that I really love science and I really love to write. Um, and so I wanted to see if there was something I could do at the interface of those two things. Uh, which it turns out there is. Um, so I went back to school and got a master's degree in science writing from MIT. Um, and uh, so that's what I do now. Um, so I'm a staff news writer for the, uh, the news section of a cancer journal called Cancer Discovery. Um, 
so kind of tasked with basically covering whatever's new and hot in uh, cancer research, cancer policy, everything within that realm. Um, and then I also am able to freelance on the side of that, uh, including for Wellesley Magazine. So I write uh, a lot of science profiles and, and stories for them. Um, and yeah, I guess, you know, in, in terms of goals, I mean, for me, the overarching goal is really just accurately communicating about science, which I feel like the last year has really driven that um, point home for all of us. Uh, and, you know, continuing to explore different ways that, that I can do that effectively. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I've only been a science journalist for, I guess, technically, but three or four years now. Um, so still kind of uh, gaining experience in that, but I'm happy to talk about, uh, yeah, anything, anything related to that. I love letting people know about it because I did not know that existed when I was an undergraduate at Wellesley. So uh, happy to, to share what my experience has been. Thanks. I can go next. Um, so um, very unique experience. I was also pre-med in undergrad. I did a couple internships in wet labs. Um, and once I graduated, I actually really didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to acknowledge, because this is the case for me, that there is um, in some cultures, a cultural and familial pressure to go into medicine um, that can be really difficult, especially when you're, um, you know, 20 and 21 trying to figure out what you want to do. Um, I ended up just by chance working for a healthcare software company. So kind of customer service, also kind of technical. So I learned to code and troubleshoot, uh, kind of similar to Stephanie. And this was at a company called Meditech, which is Massachusetts based. And I stayed there for three and a half years. About two years in, I knew I wanted to go back into healthcare and work directly with patients. Um, and one of the aspects I did enjoy was talking to customers and being able to help them. So I actually just Googled what I could do with a bio degree and I came across genetic counseling um, and it seemed to fit what I like about being a provider, which is being able to educate, do research, teach, and also um, talk to patients and help them psychosocially and counsel them. Um, so I applied for a couple of jobs and ended up being a research assistant for um, Boston Children's Hospital in two genetics research studies. So I was very lucky to get that opportunity. I worked there for a year and a half. I applied for grad school. I ended up going to Emory, which is in Atlanta for genetic counseling. It's a two-year master's program. And now I am at NYU Lingone. I'm a genetic counselor and research coordinator for their undiagnosed diseases program. Um, so, you know, I kind of took a windy path, but I feel like I'm exactly where I should be. Um, and I definitely learned a lot of um, skills throughout all of my different experiences. And I think it's really just helped me to be where I am today. Awesome, I'm happy to follow Tina. Um, I think what's most exciting about being here tonight is when I think about my time at Wellesley, I, I, I believed that I knew that I wanted to either go the route of medicine or education. Sounds like some others here have, have had that medicine thinking as well. And um, the deciding factor for me was actually attending a career panel at Wellesley College on the bottom floor of Clapp Library. Um, it was recent grads who had gone, or alum, um, a lot of recent grads at the time too, who had gone into education. And I remember leaving the room and just like, that's it. That's what I wanna do. I knew I loved science. I've always loved education. Um, and it was, that truly was the moment of realization for me that this is the path I wanted to take. And so I remember going to a lot of other information sessions that were held on campus, just educational institutions coming and looking for career educators. And, um, and so that was the path I took. And 
I remember, um, again, sitting in a lecture hall and listening to a teaching fellowship program that was offered at Newton Country Day School, um, so in nearby independent school, and I uh, thought, like, that, that sounds like the perfect mix, because I had been in, engrossed in science, and I hadn't done any of the education training um, that came along with the courses in that department, and so I work, I um, applied, and I, I was so grateful to have that opportunity to work as a teaching fellow for a one-year program there. And then that's when I decided I was going to go back to Wellesley College and get my teaching certificate. So I took some education courses with the program there. Um, and I have been teaching science ever since I left in 02. And I, I now actually work for the Wellesley Public Schools. So I am just um, down the street from campus. And I, I worked in some independent schools, as I mentioned, for a few years, first out of um, college and I've been in Wellesley um, with the public schools for 16 years now and so I currently serve in the role of department head for science and tech engineering um, which allows me uh, the benefit to still teach so I teach one section um, of a healthcare science class to seniors that are there it's the second year of the um, course and it's an exciting curriculum that partners with uh, the med science program at Harvard Medical School so students get to participate in true clinical experiences um, with mannequin patients to really try and problem solve and work their way through those cases. And, um, and then alongside that, I have administrative duties. And so along this path, I went back and I got a master's in science um, teaching. And um, then I got a certificate for advanced educational studies, um, both at BC. And the certificate was for ed leadership. So I've been in administration for um, about seven years and I am happy to share that I've, I've kept a strong connection with the education program in Wellesley and at the high school we've housed uh, several um, science students who um, are also in the education program and are doing their student teaching. So I wanna say in the last three to four years, we've probably had four to five Wellesley students do their student teaching at Wellesley High School in the science department, which has been awesome. Um, and I think just if I, th you know, personal professional goals, I, I, I knew when, like I said, the moment I walked out of that career panel, it was about education and science for me. And I've been able to maintain that. And I think where I really find my joy now um, is not only in the classroom with my own students, but helping other science educators really hone their craft. Develop it um, for those that are new, but for those that have been at it, just sharing experiences and um, you know pro professional strengths and helping them grow so that hopefully we um, can influence the next generation um, of educators and of scientists coming forward. Uh, so, uh, my, my path was similar in terms of when I was at Wellesley, probably for three of my four years, I was um, pretty decided that I was going to medical school. Uh, but as I got into my senior year, I was thinking that I might want to take a break or, or at least step back for a while and, and think about whether that's really what I wanted to do. And so my first job out of school, I worked at MIT in an oceanography lab, which was a great experience because we, we were not only working in the lab, but we were taking uh, trips to all sorts of um, nice places in, um, around the world. And, and that was a lot of fun, uh, but it did uh, make me realize that I wasn't really meant for working in a laboratory. I didn't really enjoy that part of the work, uh, but it did get me interested in working in the environmental field. I, I'd always had, you know, I always, I have a natural interest in the environment. And um, so it led me to look at what other types of things work I could do in the environment that wasn't um, so, technically based. And I, the next job I took was working for the state of Massachusetts as an, in their environmental regulatory uh, department, the Department of Environmental Protection. And I worked in a program um, initially doing field work, kind of assisting in doing assessments of hazardous waste sites. 
and um, planning cleanups of those sites. And I went back to school along the way because I was really less interested in the field work and more in the big picture policy type work that goes with um, environmental regulation. So I went back to the Kennedy School um, and I got a master's degree in public policy. And um, that's the kind of work I do now. I, I um, work in the same similar program where uh, you take um, contaminated property, sometimes referred to as brownfields types property, and you clean them up so that they can be redeveloped and put back into productive use and you make um, sure that conditions are safe. Um, I, I'm involved a lot with a lot of different um, interdisciplinary groups. I work with attorneys and economists. I, when I went back to the Kennedy School, those were the skills I picked up there that I really didn't have as a biological science major. I hadn't taken economics as an undergrad, but um, that was a really valuable part of the master's degree to do um, coursework in economics and statistics and um, more analytical, developing uh, more uh, data analysis skills that I use in my job now. Um, and I think my, uh, what I enjoy about my work and what my goal is in my work is that I believe um, that uh, you can do um, good things, positive things with government. I believe in in um, good government and, and really serving the public in the work with, that we do. So uh, that's, that's the goal I bring to all the different projects that we work on. And I use my biology background um, continuously. Um, it, it, it finds its way into all the different topics that we deal with, whether it's uh, toxicology in terms of looking at um, chemical impacts or setting standards in regulation. Um, cleaning up sites and restoring natural resources. So I'm always very close to that, uh, but I get to also use other skill sets and um, focus on um, things that require um, writing and other parts of um, the types of work that I like to do. So it's a very nice combination of uh, taking that background, but applying it uh, in the regulatory field. Thank you all so much. Uh, I think suffice it to say, we all have a really good first look at the breadth and diversity of what a biology degree can get you and what kind of career paths it can get you. Um, and I think we're all so excited to learn a lot more from each of you. Um, but now I'm going to pass it off to my wonderful co-moderator, Sophia, with the first question. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, our first question for all of you is, Given where you are in your career path now, are there any types of classes that you would recommend for students who are interested in pursuing a similar career? Um, and along that line, are there any outside experiences and opportunities that you think students should pursue? Um, I can start because I'm, I guess, more recently graduated from my master's program. so. Um, it's pretty easy to find the requirements for all of the programs. There's about 40 right now in the US. Um, it's typically a lot of the pre-med requirements actually, and some genetics courses. And then they also want to see a lot of psychology courses. So I won't go into detail about you know every single course because I think you can look that up. Um, but specifically at Wellesley, um, I see Yui, I took his uh, class, it's a 300 level evolutionary biology class, really awesome. Um, if you wanna go into genetics counseling, definitely take genetics courses and I would recommend that one. You get a lot of hands-on lab experience and research experience from start to finish of the whole process down to writing the report. That's a lot of good skills. I actually used um, the report I wrote for that class as a writing template um, when I interviewed for my job that I got at Boston Children's. Um, other than that, I think if you haven't already, definitely take a look at some language courses. It's always helpful to be um, 
you know, multilingual in healthcare. Um, and they often actually look for that when they're hiring, um, especially Spanish and other common languages. Um, as far as just Wellesley courses in general, take advantage of all of it. I think like that's the, the best part about Wellesley. You get to take any type of course you want with like true experts um, and pretty much the only time you can do all of that, explore it. That's part of your education. Um, I ended up taking additional courses after the fact um, because I didn't know that's what I wanted to do. Um, I took a couple courses at like Harvard Extension and Boston College. So they do have those opportunities too. So don't feel like you have to cram it all in undergrad um, if you want to take some time off. And I will also just say they often like to see um, some gap years in their applicants just because you'll have some real world experience and um, have time to really explore the field to know that this is the direction that you want to go in. Yeah, I think from me, I definitely think there are like two kind of classes of um, or two kind of categories of classes I would recommend. I think the first, um, I think everyone who's in this panel probably majoring in biology will get the opportunity to choose um, those 300 level seminars. Uh, the ones that I had were Kim Stem Cells and uh, Yui's Evo Devo class that Tina already brought up, but those classes were um, really, really fun to begin with, but also were really critical in helping teach, you know, how to look at a scientific article and think critically and articulating kind of your opinions and your thoughts about it, which I think um, even if you don't go to study stem cells or evolutionary biology are really helpful to um, as like a more of soft skill to you know, apply to when you go to a company or you enter into academia yourself to be able to think and articulate your ideas and opinions kind of clearly. I think that was one of the biggest takeaways I had from the major. Um, I think the second kind of category of classes that I highly recommend would be um, something that's like outside of the envelope. I think when you're um, pre-med or kind of down this particular track um, and STEM definitely has more of a, a bad reputation for this, but you kind of get sucked into, oh, I have to take Gen Chem then Gen Chem too. And you get into this track of saying, okay, well, I can't take this class that I'm really interested in outside of these departments just because it's gonna to be too busy or it's gonna to be too hard or too difficult. Um, I definitely recommend if anything interests you at all, um, kind of extracurricularly or from a class perspective to take advantage of that. If you um, want to take comp sci and that's always something you were kind of tangentially interested in, take the opportunity in the four years that you have to really do it. Because once you graduate, the opportunities, um, I wouldn't say diminish, but it becomes harder. Uh, when you're in college, everyone's super open to you trying new things. Um, I definitely should have studied abroad. I know that was something that I couldn't do. Um, but you know, when I was at Wellesley, I really made an effort to do things that were outside of my comfort zone. Um, both from a class perspective, I uh, took women and gender studies classes, which I loved, um, which led me to a health and society minor. Um, but I also did like off campus research uh, at MGH, which was a bit untraditional. Most do it at MIT, but I just found a lab that I fell in love with. So I really pushed myself to kind of do that extra mile and, and to do whatever really interested me. And I think that's the biggest takeaway I would um, hope everyone here gets since uh, it, it feels very far away from me, even though it was three years ago. But you know, if I could go back, there are so many things that I would have done that I was too scared or too busy to do and uh, definitely push push yourself to do it because uh, time time does kind of become different when you graduate. Um, so yeah, so for me, uh, something I, as a kind of science journalist and being in science communication, I, um, you know, I'm asked to cover a really broad range of science. I mean, basically anything that falls within the realm of science is something that I could be writing about. Um, so I really appreciate 
appreciated just taking a lot of different kinds of science classes at Wellesley. Um, you know, not only the biology classes that were part of the major, but also physics, chemistry. Um, I read about those topics and th those are the only classes that I've ever, ever taken. So um, that's my, my background and kind of base that I have when I'm inevitably going to Wikipedia to look up what this thing is that I need to, to learn about. Um, and I didn't actually take any writing classes at Wellesley besides the required uh, first year writing class. So that's something that if I were to do it again, I would probably do differently. Um, since, you know, I, I didn't get a lot of practice writing um, as an undergraduate, although uh, the Wellesley de de biology department does kind of make you write a lot anyway. Um, <laughs> so, so that was helpful. Um, and I think there are actually, I think the, the Calderwood seminar series, if that's what it's called, um, there are some courses that are kind of positioned at the interface of, you know, biology or math or, or um, these kind of hard sciences and writing. So if you're specifically interested in, you know, science communication, that might be something to look into. Um, and uh, yeah, so as far as outside experiences, kind of in line with what I'm talking about with the coursework, but I just I was able to do a lot of different kinds of research. Um, and that's helpful because now when I write about different things, I at least kind of know the basic techniques and, um, you know, what people might be doing in the lab and what they're talking about. And uh, I spend a lot of my time interviewing scientists and trying to get them to explain things to me. And so it, it's been really helpful to have at least a strong foundation so I know what questions to ask and kind of how to, to push the conversation. Um, so yeah, but uh, I there are people who are in um, science communication, some of them get there through my route, which is from a science background, but you can also go from more of a, a journalist background. Um, so there are kind of trained journalists that pivot into science communication. Um, so that's another option, maybe less relevant for the folks listening tonight, but uh, just something to think about, so. I'm happy to, to share too. I think, I think of two sort of buckets um, when I, that I think are worthwhile to share this evening. I think one, for me, um, as a science, as a high school science educator, um, and I've taught chemistry and biology classes at the high school level, um, I think that you know we laugh a lot, and that the by the time you finish sort of your upper level biology courses, and then going on and taking perhaps grad courses as well in the content area areas, there's so little of that in a lot of ways that's going to make its way into a high school classroom. Um, just when you think about the level of details that you dive into. And so the, there's enormous value in that because it just helps solidify the foundation um, of your content understanding. And that's always valuable to have that great solid foundation to communicate um, when you enter education. But I think um, one would be for me in terms of recommendations, just um, similar to what was said before, but outside of your content area. So it may be physics, it may be chemistry, it may be astronomy, you know, it could be other science courses. But then I also think there is great value in just taking advantage of the opportunity that you have right now with, um, with so many disciplines and departments at your fingertips. I think more than ever um, in, in the present world of education, especially at the high school level, there is such a push for interdisciplinary learning and um, drawing connections and, and finding those cross-cutting concepts. And so I think if you, you know, have the bug to perhaps explore a career in education, then I would push you to explore um, not just your biology classes, but, but outside um, that realm of, of sort of familiarity as well, because I, I do, um, I think it's nice to always think through a critical lens when you are enjoying other opportunities and just trying to uncover where you can um, make this connection back to be able to 
you know, tell a unique story or make this connection um, for your students. I think all the time that, you know, though I'm not delivering the detail of my upper level courses, the fact that I can tell stories about, you might eventually learn if you go on to, um, and those are the things that I find students really grasp um, onto and just, it, it allows them to relate what they're learning in the classroom to real life. And so some of that is science content outside of the biology curriculum, but I honestly think you know, I remember taking a medical anthropology class at Wellesley when I was there and loving every, every little part of it because it had that, you know, the medicine touch that would intrigued me in the healthcare aspect, but it also just brought in the social science as well. And I think that that was um, such an interesting way to look at a topic that I had, um, that I hadn't considered until I really had that experience. So I echo what was said before me, but take the risks. Now is the time you have, imagine you have a brochure, which you do in front of you, um, that's gonna go away in a short time to just learn, learn about whatever you'd like to, to do. Take those risks, push yourself outside of your comfort zone. Um, you're in a wonderful place to, to do it and to land safely, no matter, um, even if you realize you don't like it, that's just as valuable a lot of times in realizing what you love. So definitely push yourselves um, to think outside the box of just the biological sciences. Um, so I think uh, it, it's true that the types of courses you take for pre-med really are such a solid base for environmental science work. And um, that would prepare you well in terms of the sciences. I, I mean, there are courses I took after after leaving Wellesley in geology, um, in, in environmental chemistry, where I just wanted some additional uh, content. But um, for environmental policy work, what, um, what I still needed after I left Wellesley, which I mentioned was to do the economics and more work in statistics and, and data analysis and, and get those skills. Um, I didn't have them at, at that time. Um, I, when I was at Wellesley, I did take a lot of courses outside of the sciences. Um, I, those really were usually some of my favorite courses, which might have been telling at the time that I was really enjoying spending time on those other courses. So I, you know, I maxed out on credits outside of the biological science major. Um, and, and I think that's really beneficial because, um, it's 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 all about you know being well rounded and in your thought process. So um, I as I'd echo everyone else who encourages you to you know take a broad range of courses. Thank you guys all so much for answering that question, and I'm going to pass it back to Emma. Sophia and to all of our panelists, um, I think we really uh, kind of got a sense of the strengths of maybe a non-linear or non-traditional career path. Um, and of course, risk taking and kind of exploring all the different options and, you know, possibilities that are open to you during undergrad. Um, but given your current occupation for our next question, if students are interested in uh, perhaps following or, you know, loosely mimicking where you are now, um, what sorts of positions and roles um, would students typically get, you know, right out of college? Like what would be the sort of introductory first roles that students would experience um, leading up to perhaps the field that you're in now? I'm happy to, to lead this one off because I think it's probably um, pretty direct, but I think if you are interested in a career in education um, and just landing somewhere in the field of education, whether it be the classroom teacher, administrator, or whatnot, um, definitely teaching um, would be probably the, the first thing that someone might explore. I do think there's a lot of opportunities for teaching assistants and educational assistants out there as well. If you realize, you know, maybe I want to give this a try, but you haven't um, had that educational um, background just with courses, student teaching and whatnot. And so for me, I, you know, I think it is, it's the path that I took. I went to the ind independent schools for my 
first few years of teaching because I didn't have math certification for teaching. Um, and because I hadn't had those education courses, I just needed um, to be able to, you know, go through the process and the appropriate licensure to, to gain that certification. And so if that is where you are um, at at that point, then I would definitely look into independent schools. Many of them are still offering those sorts of teaching fellowship opportunities. Um, if you know that science education is where you wanna be, um, then I would definitely be in touch with the education department at Wellesley College and, um, and me, because maybe if you'd like to do your student teaching in science, you could do it just down the street at Wellesley High School. Um, we would welcome that a great deal also. So I, just classroom teaching, I think that's certainly in the terms of education is the, is the, um, the best way to start if that's where you know you wanna end up is in a classroom um, in front of students. Um, so yeah, so for me, uh, you know, one of the kind of inflection points of my career transition was um, doing a master's degree in science writing. Uh, so I you know, felt like I had a pretty strong science background. I felt like I was a strong writer. I had no idea how to actually move into the, the industry of science communication. Um, so that was a, a really valuable step. Uh, for me, it came after a uh, master's degree in biology. You know, for a lot of people, they kind of move right into those programs. Um, if people are, are interested in the specifics, I, I'm happy to chat more about that uh, separately. But there are four basically specific science writing master's programs um, in the US. Uh, so those are worth looking into. Um, but of course, there are many ways to get into it. Um, so fr from the kind of science journaliz journalism side of things, um, internships are sometimes a big part of that. So most um, kind of science journalism publications will have uh, internships for kind of the fall, spring, and summer um, periods. Uh, so those are a good way to get experience. They tend to be paid, though not very much. Um, and then also, I think probably just looking for um, kind of entry-level jobs at institutions, universities, hospitals. Um, sometimes there are different ways to do science communication in those settings. Um, and then, you know, it's always possible to do kind of freelancing or contact editors at, at publications that interest you and, and just uh, pitch an idea you have or, or see if, if they'd be willing to try you out to write an article. Um, so getting those first few stories published is really helpful, however you can do that. Um, there may be places even at Wellesley where you could do that, just to have something that you can show someone to say, you know, this is my writing. Um, and uh, this is what you'll be getting if, if I'm working with you. Um, so yeah, so there, it's not really a clear path, but, but a few different options. I think in, um, in my field in, in, in environmental, um, in the, the different environmental routes you can take, uh, a lot of people start out by working in consulting firms. So uh, those, those firms can do work um, in terms of uh, land development and cleanup, or they might also work on water systems, public water systems. Um, there, they would be doing work in uh, clean air and working with industry in terms of um, you know, engineering for those systems. So a, a lot of the entry level jobs are, are in consulting and um, then people would typically go back and um, get, get an additional uh, master's degree if they wanted to focus on policy um, for that. So that, that kind of gives you both the technical background, some experience you can draw on, and then um, the skill sets that you might get from some additional coursework. Um, a lot of, a lot of people, it, which may not be relevant to this group, but a lot of people get into environmental policy through law, law schools. So there are a lot of people, um, in our agency that are, um, heading up programs that are also attorneys. So that, that's another route. Um, 
but I, I do think they're at a disadvantage in, in, on a lot of topics in not being able to sort of fall back on um, being comfortable with the science part of the problems that we're dealing with. Yeah, I can go next. I think for corporate, um, how you get in is pretty amorphous. There's um, a couple of more standard ways. Um, and then there's kind of more wild ways. And I think uh, that makes it very promising. And um, if you're very gung ho about joining a company, it doesn't really matter what background I've seen at all. Um, so I, I mentioned earlier, I was part of a defined um, program that you know a lot of companies have for recent graduates. So um, mine was called the Digital Leadership Program, but a lot of the leadership development programs out there uh, do heavily recruit from colleges um, or grad schools. So that's definitely a very great way to join. Um, I know I joined with a class of uh, recent college graduates and we had vastly different backgrounds. So um, you had your fair share of bio majors, you had your business majors. Um, I think at first I definitely felt like I was at a disadvantage because, um, you know, in my role, when I was interviewing, they asked if I had done anything like Excel or coding. And I think, um, the degree of which I touched Excel or PowerPoint was vastly different from someone who would have, um, you know, studied business as their major from college. And I definitely felt very, it was a very daunting experience to say, yeah, I could also do that. But um, I think those kind of leadership development programs give you that space to be able to learn um, and to develop those skills. So I definitely recommend looking into those. Um, and it's definitely helpful to have a kind of business related either at a startup or a company um, kind of internship before you apply to jobs once you graduate, but definitely not necessary. Um, my internship before going into it was just doing my thesis research at my lab. So um, I never had any background in that sort of matter. Um, so it's really about how you can articulate, you know, transferring your biology and like hard STEM skills to being more like soft and um, how it would be more of a liberal arts education um, translation. And then, um, but I, you know, I've, I've seen so many different paths from my colleagues at CVS. There are people who've done masters of public health and decided they wanted to join a company. I've seen people who um, originally started as a pharmacist and decided, oh, maybe I'll take on more managerial positions and then ended up in corporate. So um, there's definitely a lot of different ways. Um, I think consulting is also a very defined path where, you know, they heavily recruit out of undergrad and you can join and it becomes more of a um, linear path into a company or um, if you want to stay in consulting, I think they do look for a lot of STEM majors um, as well since, you know, they're not looking for one defined kind of person, they're looking for holistic people. So I guess the kind of long, long way to say, um, you can pretty much do anything and end up kind of where I am. And I think that's very exciting. Um, so, yeah. My answer is very similar. Um, so I know someone who worked on a marijuana farm who is a gen counselor. I know someone who took no genetic courses at all and is now a gen counselor, um, someone who was a teacher. So um, similar to what Stephanie was saying, it's more about your skills. Of course, you need to meet the requirements, um, prerequisites to apply. But you know, after that, you're gonna learn the rest in grad school. Um, what they wanna know is when you're sitting there and interviewing with them, why do you wanna go into this field? What experience do you have? Um, what insight do you have with people living with genetic conditions? Um, another prerequisite is counseling. So most people will get that counseling experience through volunteering. So I volunteered for Planned Parenthood's counseling and referral hotline. Um, other people have volunteered for um, crisis hotlines, suicide or rape hotlines, um, domestic violence. 
Um, and there are positions out there to be a genetic counseling assistant. Um, not everyone is going to get that position. Um, I think I know one person in my class that was a genetic counseling assistant. Uh, we all have very diverse backgrounds. Some of us have never done any research prior to entering school. Um, my experience in research helped kind of shape my interest, and that's why I'm now also in research as a research coordinator. But um, they really just want to know, you know, can you get along with people? Can you talk to them um, in a crisis situation? Um, and for applying to school, it's also about like fitting in. So, you know, pursue your interests. Um, just as we've all been saying with courses, pursue your interests with career choices too. Um, first jobs that you get out of college don't have to be your forever jobs, um, as you can see. So really just you want to develop yourself. Um, skills about public speaking. Are you able to do things like customer service, for example? Um, troubleshooting, uh, puzzle solving. So more kind of basic, um, and I would say definitely being from Wellesley, uh, being a well-rounded person um, helps a lot. I think if you graduate from Wellesley, I think you're, you have the ability to go into joint counseling if you wanted to. All right, thank you. Um, I'm happy to take the wheel for the next question. Uh, we have two questions left before going into the general Q&A. And both of these questions have an air of uh, discussing COVID and how they've how COVID has affected your job and the field of your job. Um, so I know that there's a lot of anxiety in the student body about what, what the job search is gonna be like post-college and just exploring those options. So our first question is about what is your, I guess, what does your day-to-day -day job look like normally and how has that changed with COVID? So I guess I can go because I graduated um, during the pandemic, which was interesting. Um, so we had a switch to telemedicine. So we use Zoom to speak with patients. Um, it did at the time affect some of my classmates um, because of budgeting issues. I'm sure you've heard about it through all fields um, in hospitals. Um, they could no longer offer certain positions, but I am happy to say all of my classmates have jobs now. Um, so it's a very adaptable field. Um, in terms of seeing patients, our research was shut down for a couple of months. Um, we kind of started slowly back. I'm going into the office every day. I've been in person since I've started this job. Uh, I am now able to enroll patients and disclose results to them also over Zoom and WebEx. Um, so I will say that's kind of one of the unique aspects of um, genetic counseling is that we were one of the few programs that were able to graduate on time because we could quickly transition to telemedicine. Um, and, you know, telecounseling and telemedicine is kind of where in general healthcare is trying to push forward to increase access for um, in need populations that are far away in rural areas. So I'd say it's pretty um, amenable and it will withstand um, you know, this pandemic for sure. And in terms of um, going to school, um, you know, we all adjusted. Um, everyone is very understanding. So I just wanna speak to that. Um, it's definitely a difficult time, but you know, you'll definitely get through. Uh, I can jump in. Um, so my, my job was primarily office based in Boston. Uh, but now uh, we're all working from home. Um, it's kind of uh, 
a big, a big shift for a government agency because we weren't one where we had a lot of telecommuting. So we had to quickly um, set everyone up to work from home. Um, and that's been interesting, but I think long-term it's going to be very good for us because um, now we've shown that we can do it. Um, in terms of environmental impacts, there are a lot of benefits to not having um, everyone commuting all the time. Uh, so I think when, when things do finally get back to normal, um, I think there's gonna be a shift in, our, in the way we do work and, and we'll be doing more of this in the long term. Um, it means uh, I have, I have um, people that I supervise. So like a lot of people, I'm in a lot of different meetings um, scheduled across across the week, um, just to reg regularly touch base with people, and um, that's been an adjustment to kind of figure out how to make that work um, well. Uh, we also, because we deal with um, the people we regulate, we've um, had public meetings uh, with them, and we've set up routine office hours where people can just kind of check in with us um, so we can keep that connection um, with the people we regulate and kind of keep the lines of communication open. So um, there, there have been a lot of benefits that we discovered in terms of being um, better at reaching people and just being more accessible in general. So, um, so there, there have definitely been some, um, some upsides that we're gonna take with us uh, when we get back into the office. Um, I, can, I can share next. Uh, so, so in terms of my kind of typical day-to-day, I spend my time kind of split between, uh, you know, developing story ideas, kind of looking at what's coming out and, and determining what merits news coverage for us. Um, and then once I'm writing a story, doing a lot of research, figuring out who to contact, you know, interviewing a bunch of scientists and researchers um, that maybe have written a paper or, um, you know, can provide their perspective on something. And then at the end of that, I get to sit down and actually write the story. Um, and now I've been taking on a bit of, of editing work and, and we have a, a print issue that we publish every month. So I'm also involved in uh, pulling that together. Um, as far as how that's changed, basically, instead of doing all of that in an office, now I'm doing all of that from home. Um, because of the, the nature of our work, uh, I've typically always done inter interviews by phone or over video chat. So that part of my job has pretty much stayed the same. Um, but I am writing about COVID a lot. Uh, so um, specifically looking at the intersection of, of COVID and cancer. Um, so, you know, that's been challenging because it's a really fast moving situation. Um, for example, when the pandemic started, I wrote a story about how COVID was going to affect uh, cancer screening. And at the time, the people I talked to weren't that concerned about it. And now I'm essentially going back to them uh, eight or nine months later to say, okay, but but now is this gonna be a problem? Um, so, so that's been kind of interesting. Uh, and then another big change that I think will uh, general, and this is, I guess, more on the research side than the, the writing side, but uh, all of our big cancer conferences have become virtual, um, which, uh, you know, is, difference in terms of taking away some of those in-person networking opportunities, um, but also like the conference that my organization um, hosts, we usually have about 30,000 people there. And I think our virtual version had like maybe 80,000 people. So a lot more access where um, people that, that wouldn't be able to get funding to go to an in-person conference now can access everything related to that conference virtually. Um, so I think that's that's been kind of a, a silver lining. Um, and yeah, I, I think that's mainly what's changed for me, so. Yeah, I think my day-to-day um, -day life, as um, most people have already said, um, is, you know, largely 
changed and unchanged in multiple ways. Uh, I definitely don't use Zoom at work. We use WebEx, so I'm not very skilled at Zoom. You'll see me fidgeting around, but um, yeah, I think you know, originally I worked in an office located in Wellesley, um, sometimes spending time in the Boston office and traveling down to the Rhode Island headquarters. Um, not doing that and not having that commute has been different, but um, most of the work had always been done, you know, over the phone with our stakeholders, trying to convince people or meeting in person. Um, that's just been converted to virtual, but still largely remains unchanged. And then the day-to-day -day of what I do, largely you know articulating and creating powerpoints um sometimes building financial models originally my first role i used to do a lot of coding sql python um and and i i was terrible at that so i don't do that anymore but um i think the the lack of a commute has been um different for sure trying to get into the mind space of okay what is work and what is life um and having that kind of distinctive balance has been a bit different um before i think cvs had a very great uh you know work-life balance of you log off at 5 p.m and you kind of go home and you get to turn everything off um, which is different from you know my college days because i was always kind of in the zone what's the next essay what's the next um thing that i have to do uh now people are more um inclined to you know message you at 7 p.m saying oh you're at home like can you do this thing um and i, I think I'll, I'll just add one final point which is you know at a company as large as CVS that um, has a very robust hr system they have um been very very gracious and lenient um you know i have a uh, i'm a high risk population because i have asthma so um i kind of told everyone in the very beginning march saying i won't be going back to the office until um there's kind of a resolution to the problem uh, or to the pandemic and they were really gracious in saying you know we won't have you come back until you have to which um i know is a place of privilege and i think um that that's been very uh, very new to me, but um, a company like CVS is usually very supportive in these um, kind of situations. So, and I can speak, and and many of you who are here tonight probably know a lot of um, of what I'm I'm gonna share and what I'm experiencing because you're experiencing it yourself um, as as students and on that end of things and. Education has changed dramatically in a very short amount of time. Um, and I remember um, speaking with an education seminar at Wellesley College last spring, and it was it was still the wonder of like, do you think I'm going to have to interview online? What is that going to look like? And and now um, the answer was yes. It ended up being yes. And now as we look at things, you know, it's just I. You know, there were a lot of people working all summer long to try and figure out what the school year was going to look like and really didn't even necessarily know how it would take shape until weeks or days before. And what the reality of education is now is, um, at least at Wellesley High School, is half the students in a classroom with you wearing masks six feet apart and the other half zooming in to your lesson. Um, and so as an educator, you're now teaching two audiences um, in a way that you haven't had to before and just the safety precautions that are in place as you know as we navigate our way through um this situation is it's hard i think that um you know i think educators are exhausted i'm sure as students you're exhausted too and it's it's really different and what i think you know there's a sense of loss because what we've worked so hard for so many years to really allow for tangible, interactive, collaborative, creative opportunities have to some degree taken a backseat just to the safety measures that exist now. And so um, uh, we spent a lot of time brainstorming, can we even do lab activities, experiments with students? How do we handle the materials and transition from one class to another? And so there's many logistics um, to be considered and that were considered. And, and so, you know, I would, I would not be truthful if I was saying, we, it, it looks just like it did it's with the minor adjustments here and there um, a year ago. It's really different. It's really different. It's really hard. Um, you know, I think there's, there's more silence in the classroom than I have heard 
in almost my 20 year career now. And there's just not an opportunity for students to even turn and talk and do group work like they used to. And, and so we're adjusting and we're, we're doing the best we can and forever grateful for the students who are understanding and forgiving and flexible for us as well. Um, but I think that, you know, I think it's bringing challenges in a way that no one ever saw coming. Um, and, you know, there's a silver lining in everything and it exists here is that, you know, as educators, we've become more familiar with technology than we ever were before or ever thought we would need to be. And I think that, um, you know, similarly to what Liz was saying is some of what has ended up happening as a result of this is going to continue happening because we realize we actually can do things we had never tried to do before. And so I think there are the added benefits of the learnings um, and just the need to find resources um, that would work for online lessons with students that um, you know, weren't discovered before, but now there's great, there's great opportunities and um, resources out there. And so there are things from which we benefit and at the same time, um, you know, education certainly does not look the way that it looked uh, just, you know, six, eight, nine months ago. Um, that said, I, you know, I think we'll get back to the place where, where it will, and perhaps we'll be even better than before because of the learnings that we've had. Jennifer, would you like to transition now into the Q&A? Yes, of course. And first and foremost, hello, uh, everyone. And um, thank you for joining us today at, uh, uh, with your extra time and especially to the panelists and the biology department for welcoming BC Squared onto this collaborative panel. And um, so now we'll be opening up the floor for the Q&A section. So um, we'll be opening up the chat function. So everyone who's been here in the meeting, if you have any specific questions um, for our panelists, uh, we are now allowing you to put that in and we will be answering them or the panelists will be answering them accordingly. Yes, real quick, our wonderful attendees. I just hopefully enabled the chat for everyone. Can somebody send me, you know, like a thumbs up on the screen or a thumbs up reaction to let me know if you have access to the chat and can indeed type your question into the chat? Okay, amazing. I'm seeing thumbs up. Thank God. Okay, send us your questions. And feel free to direct those questions to any individual as well. It doesn't need to be a broad question to everyone. Um, we can, we actually have some prepared questions just to kick it off. So we're just going to like list off for any personal questions. So we're going to start with Liz Callahan. So um, thank you, um, Liz, for, uh, or do you prefer Miss Callahan? Uh, so well, thank you for joining us. And it is such a pleasure to have you on our panel, like looking at your repertoire and your experience. It's very amazing to see how you can balance science and government because right now in these trying times, it's hard to imagine these two working coherently together. But particularly, we're kind of interested in understanding how like um, within your specific kind of discipline, how you manage to juggle politics, law and science at the same time. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think uh, for a time I, I viewed my job as uh, just trying to get to the right answer and um, thinking that, you know, the best options would be persuasive. But at, when you get to a certain level, when you're dealing with a certain level of problems, um, the politics do come into it. And um, fortunately, on the state level and in a state like Massachusetts, um, there's a lot of support for what we do. So it, it's certainly, I, I think, less um, friction there than there, there are um, in other programs um, right now. Uh, but um, I, I think it all comes down to um, 
understanding, um, you know, understanding the people you're working with, un understanding the different interest groups, um, making sure that you're hearing from all those interest groups and representing them uh, because you're not gonna be successful if um, you can't really um, address address the needs of those different groups. Uh, so you learn that over time uh, and you have different experiences where um, you're not successful or, uh, and, and you take something from that, you know, to the next, to the, the next um, project that you're working on. So th that's definitely something that is, um, uh, that you gain over time with experience on working with different projects. Um, you have to know who, who has what interests and um, be reaching out to them and getting their input. And, and uh, I think that's what makes for um, successful policymaking is just, just um, having your ear to that and, and making sure um, you're paying attention to those things because you will be asked when you make a proposal, the first uh, question your, um, your boss or the, the decision maker is going to ask is who's, who's gonna be happy with this and, and who's not gonna be happy with this. So you have to have worked all of those, those situations out and be ready to answer that. Thank you so much for your very in-depth answer. That's very insightful, thank you. And um, I believe so, we have a student in the chat that has uh, asked Stephanie particularly. Um, so the question is, how did you realize that med school is not for you? I guess this question also can extend to the other uh, panelists who have also kind of juggled with the career path of um, potentially medicine as well. Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, well, thank you so much, Birika, for the question. And um, I'll, I'll quickly also say thank you really a lot for um, all the moderators of this panel. It's been a really great experience. And um, I'm super happy to be here. And um, you guys are doing an excellent, excellent job of moderating so um, and organizing. So great job to you guys. Um, so yeah, I think for medical school, something Tina said to me uh, or said to the group earlier really resonated with me, which is, you know, there is a lot of familial pressure. Um, I think from my end, you know, my parents both were um, originally in medicine. My grandparents were all originally in medicine. And so it became a very familial legacy kind of part of it. Um, and why I realized medicine wasn't for me uh, was kind of two part. Um, one was I had um, kind of gone out of my comfort zone and really dove into the clinical side of medicine. Um, I think it becomes very like wishy-washy when you just think, oh, I wanna be a doctor. You don't really know what that means. Um, so the junior year spring, I took two weeks off from um, taking my classes and I did a medical mission um, to China where I was a volunteer translator for um, some of the surgeons who went for, um, you know, con reconstructing um, spinal deformities and um, orphans. So uh, I was able to go into the OR and um, be by the bedside of um, children coming out of those surgeries. And um, I think seeing the blood, seeing the uh, other assortment of things made me really realize that that was not something I could remotely handle um, day to day and kind of emotionally, physically, it just wasn't um, reasonable for me to go into that. And then second, I think the, um, the real reason why I didn't go into medicine was I had a very honest conversation with myself about what my strengths were and what my strengths weren't. Um, what my strengths weren't were memorizing uh, things like body parts or anatomy. I, I took comparative anatomy and physiology and did terribly. Um, and I almost threw up the whole time. And so I realized that that was not something I was going to be good at. And, um, you know, that's pretty much what med medical school becomes. You take test after test. Um, and I knew I was going to be struggling kind of this uphill battle. And then I realized what I was good at was um, taking a complex ideas, kind of narrowing them down into more simplified terms, um, talking about big picture stuff, looking at um, policy and uh, you know, just generally 
more, I guess, social interaction, which was, I, I guess, like a translation into business. So that's why I didn't ultimately go into medical school. But I know that that's a great path. And for those who are interested, you can do an MD and an MBA also together. So there are a lot of paths you can explore. And um, if you don't think you can give up the MD kind of side or the path right now, you can decide later on that you wanna do more of a business side, but you will still be a doctor. So there's kind of different things you can do with it. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Um, are there any other panelists that have like uh, other inputs about like their decisions with medical school? Um, I kind of remember a clear moment. Um, I was in my internship between junior and senior year. So it was 40 hours a week, like pretty standard. Uh, I was working at the New England Primate Research Center at Harvard Medical School as a research assistant. At the same time, I had also signed up for this MCAT course that was about uh, three hours, three times a week. Um, and that slowly was exhausting me. Um, and I kind of remember attending a few, you know, pre-med meetings with advisors. I spoke to students um, and, you know, they said, I remember them saying, if you think like you're done after the, the MCAT, like think again, because like Stephanie was saying, it's a lot of tests um, for a long time. And then I remember another advisor had come from UMass Medical and said, you know, I like sleep. Um, so I didn't want to go into medicine. And I actually feel like um, that rang true with me. Like, I just like having um, a different type of work-life balance than what you could achieve for several years, um, kind of working towards being a doctor. I have several friends who are in medicine and like Stephanie, it's a wonderful career um, and they're great doctors, but there's definitely some times of um, a little bit more work and less life balance. So just didn't fit me personally. Thank you so much for your input. Definitely the work-life balance for the medical career is definitely very intense and something that all students have to debate when they're deciding for their future career paths. Um, yes, uh, to kind of keep in check with our clock and all the lots of um, wonderful questions that our students are um, asking, I'm just gonna carry on. And so there's a Student that specifically asked a question for Nora. Um, the question is, what factors made you decide to teach high school instead of uh, on a collegial level? Thank you. Um, it's a great question. And I think, um, you know, my answer at the time was I was excited to teach science. And so I thought it was something um, that I wanted to sort of delve into upon graduation. and. At that point in time, it made more sense to look at, um, you know, a K through 12 perspective or a secondary. I have taught in both middle school and high school. Um, I have not taught science at the collegiate level. And I think what, what led me to continue down this path was what I realized pretty quickly um, once I began teaching is that I genuinely had two, um, two passions that were pretty equal to one another, both education and science. And I think you know, even a lot of times people will say um, high school teachers are all about their content and, and, and wanting to get that across. And I think, you know, there's definitely truth to that. And for me, I've always been fascinated with um, a way to educate the whole child and the whole person. And so I do think that um, in, in my experiences that the ability to apply that um, exists a little bit more at the secondary level or um, the non-collegiate level. And so, you know, I think certainly when people are professors in college, their passion in most way is their content area and their subject area. And so I love biology, there's no question about it. Um, and I love education too. And so, and so it was about those two loves and how I could serve really both of them. And I think that um, the secondary experience has allowed me to do that. So you never rule out what, what might come in the future. <laughs> 
That's for sure. That's for sure. Definitely. Right now, our um, our K through 12 educators are in extremely admirable positions, especially tackling with the whole COVID situation. And um, so carrying on, um, we have a student asking about like, at what point in your career did you realize that um, you would need to pursue like a further degree, like a master's or doctorate? And how did you decide which program or degree to pursue? In my case, I decided in my late 20s, so I had worked for a few years um, in the environmental field doing environmental tech work, and I realized that I would rather be involved in the uh, bigger picture policy questions, so that's, that's why I chose a master's in public policy. I'll jump in as well. I think um, mine's a little just different because I haven't gone to get a master's or a doctorate, um, but I'm currently applying to do so. So I guess the moment you decide when to do that is um, kind of when it feels right. Um, you realize that you have a gap in some sort of way that uh, from what you want to achieve and you kind of just look for programs that interest you. So I'm currently in the process of applying to business school um, to kind of fill in some of the more technical business gaps that I wasn't able to get at Wellesley or to pick up on the job as easily. Um, yeah, that, that sort of, uh, I think what you're saying about filling in the gaps uh, for me was important. As I mentioned before, I um, kind of knew I wanted to get into to science journalism and science writing, but I didn't know how to do that, um, which is why I decided to, to get a master's degree specifically in that field. Um, so my first master's degree in biology, that was just kind of something that, that I had wanted to do for a long time. Uh, I think in some ways, a hard decision for me was deciding to not do a PhD in biology and kind of pump the brakes on what had been a longer term goal of mine um, and then pivot away into science writing. Uh, but for me, it was a good decision to get the master's degree in science writing because I didn't actually realize how little I knew about that field until I <laughs> was, was in a, a very kind of applied uh, degree program, so. And for, for education, it's just, um, at least in the state of Massachusetts, it's something eventually you will have to do um, to, to go from initial to professional licensure. And so that's part of the path. But at, you know, I think of an earlier question about sort of the best, the best route to take. And as a biology major, I had talked about if you hadn't really delved into the education end of things, um, there are definitely people that go straight from a bachelor's on to a master's in education because as part of a lot of master's programs, um, students can do their student teaching at that point in time. So if they didn't get to do it as an undergraduate, they could um, certainly do that as part of their master's program, which would then obviously set them um, set the stage for them to go and enter a classroom as a teacher if that's something they were interested in. And then, although required, the nice things are in a public um, school setting is that with each degree that you earn and credits that you earn, there is a there is a bump in pay um, as well. And so starting out with a master's means that you will have a higher starting salary than you would if you were starting out with a bachelor's. Uh, mine's pretty straightforward. If you want to be a joint counselor, it's a healthcare profession. So you do need to get your master's in it. But um, I actually know a lot of people who came from different degrees, um, got their PhDs or masters in something else, and then decided to go into genetic counseling. So I think just once you figure out that's what you want to do, um, go ahead and do it. And I'm happy to talk uh, later about how to pick programs and which programs apply to, because that's a whole nother beast. All right, so yes. Um... Uh, just to let everyone know if, if the, all the panelists are comfortable, um, if you could drop down your contact information. So if any students have further questions, if you would like to um, feel free to kind of 
talk further in conversation in that way. As for more questions, um, I think for Catherine, there's a question about as a science writer, um, how do you write for like the general public versus um, for other scientists in specific fields? And um, are there certain paths that you should be take depending on what type of audience that you're trying to specifically tailor to? Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I think uh, anytime you're writing anything, really, it's important to think about who your audience is and, and how, who you're trying to make um, this topic accessible to. Uh, so for cancer discovery, I write mostly for cancer experts that um, maybe are just wanting to stay abreast of news that isn't in their specific field, um, because as we probably all know, you know, science can get pretty specific uh, when you're when you become a researcher and more advanced. Um, so yeah, so we're writing at a, a fairly advanced level, but um, you know, assuming that whoever's reading it maybe doesn't know the ins and outs of a, a particular field. Uh, and then in terms of my my freelancing and a lot of my previous writing, that's been for more of a general audience. Um, so folks who are interested in science, uh, but potentially don't have any kind of science background or some science background. Um, so as far as certain paths you should take, um, I think in writing for kind of a cancer expert audience, it's really helpful to have a strong science background. Um, I think maybe that wouldn't be as important if you're writing for a general audience since uh, the goal there is to really get scientists to explain things to you like you're a regular person and not someone with expertise. Um, so it you don't always have to know exactly what they're talking about. And actually, sometimes that works in your favor. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's very, very nice to hear, especially when there's a decision in that aspect. And um, carrying on, uh, there was a question for Liz. So um, how would one get, be involved in the environmental field and prepare for jobs in environmental biology as an undergraduate? Um, well, there are there are internships available uh, with agencies. Uh, I think we're. I think our agency is even doing them now um, with COVID, trying to do them. Um, as I mentioned, consulting firms and environmental consulting firms also um, have internships and summer positions. Um, I'd be happy to leave people with my contact information and. Um, and um, give you some additional suggestions as well. Okay, so it looks like we are perfectly on time. So thank you so much for all the panelists who have joined us. Um, this type of perfection can only be achieved at Wellesley. And uh, of course, if everyone has any further questions and if any of the panelists would like us to kind of um, use the bi biology department as a resource kind of to connect students with you guys, please like um, shoot us an email or just drop it in the chat. And thank you to everyone who came to participate and take this extra time out of your very, very busy schedules. So yes, thank you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Everyone have a good night. Thank you very much.